Now, there's nothing worse than serving under a bad leader who's patently not up to the job. And I guess there'll be a lot of people listening to this who are nodding at the moment. Or they're worse, and they're worse or bad for the company or the country. Chris Roebuck is the Professor of Transformational Leadership at the Cass Business School in London, joining us now to look at how to pick leaders for good. Good morning to you. Uh, thanks for joining us, Chris. Good morning. Um, you know... It's a tough one, isn't it, picking the right leaders? I mean, given that the uh, intelligent and austere German people elected Adolf Hitler as Chancellor in 1933, how can any individual panel or experts or indeed nation be sure that they're getting the right person who can actually change things for good? I think the challenge is that we need to address the leadership issue because if we look economically at, at business, you know, we know we've got a significant loss of potential economic growth because we don't have good leaders. And as a result of that, we have a loss of individual potential. And as you were saying earlier, a lot of people who are nodding their heads saying, yes, I wish I had a good boss. I mean, the stats would suggest that potentially we've got 60% of people in organisations who could give 30% more effort if they had a better boss. If you think about the potential impact of that on business going through to about 10% on bottom line, we are literally throwing money away when we could do something immediately at no cost that would make leadership better. Well, I mean, you were global head of leadership at UBS yeah. for a number of years. And I mean, and given the lack of moral turpitude that came out of UBS uh, and the scandals that arose mm -hmm. over the last few years, one might be, I suppose, tempted to ask, did UBS actually pick the wrong people to do the leading? Because uh, a lot of senior managers were implicated as well. Or was it actually impossible to, to forecast when people might go bad or be tempted to do something bad? I think that the principle is as long as you have a strong culture and strong values that cascade from the top uh, and everybody sticks by them, then normally things should go OK. I mean, the one thing with the banking crisis was quite clearly banks, unlike many organisations, have the potential for a small group of people within a bank to blow up the whole system, which doesn't necessarily happen within construction or other sectors. But I think the critical problem is that what happens is that <clears throat> as the message goes down organisations, it's we want you to do business, we want you to service customers ethically, we want you to make money, but we don't want you to break the law. What tends to happen is that those caveats tend to get lost somehow as it, ca it cascades, and the people at the bottom just think, I'm here to make money whatever cost and if I don't do the figures I'm out but I think the, the big problem for me mm -hmm. um, with what you just said there is mm -hmm. that you know as the orders come down the chain mm -hmm. um, the people lower down the chain get the wrong messages it's having the right person at the top if the wrong person gets to the top um, then it's a problem all the way down as, you, as we saw with that absolutely. nobody stood up to say no uh, absolutely and, and unless the people at the top have the right ethical makeup, then you have a problem from the start. But I think the challenge for most organisations is you can actually have somebody at the top who wants to try and do a good job, but when the messages get confused when they go down, we have a challenge. You developed a programme that you called Mac 2 Leadership, not Mac 2, but Mac 2, as in aeronautics. Yep. You're giving a masterclass on that later on this week here yep. in Dubai, and you wrote a book about it called Lead to Succeed. What's the 60-second the, the overview of that? The 60-second overview is what we need to do is we need to do two things in organisations. Our leaders need to get the best from people, so people are inspired, and then that gets the extra effort, that 30%. Then we need to be able to focus that onto what delivers success. It's all very well getting the effort, but as we know, you can focus the effort on the wrong thing. So clear direction, clarity and big picture about where we're going and why we want to get there to focus the effort is what we need. Well, give me an example. You're speaking at, uh, at a, a retail event here in Dubai this week. As mm -hmm. I was giving a master class, you're speaking at a retail event. And the retail industry here in Dubai is suffering at the moment. We yep. have a lot of retailers sitting in the chair where you are now. And the consensus is that sales are down between 10 and 20%, yep. depending on which bit of retail you're in. And there'll, there'll be outliers to, to that. What can you teach them about leadership in, in a very, very tough market like this? 
in a tough market, what you need above all else is, is good leaders because you want to get to the point where they are inspiring people to give their best. What that means is people genuinely care about their organisation, irrespective of the level. If they care genuinely, and there's a we, not me culture, what happens then is we get people who look after your organisation. They'll manage risk for you. They'll manage cost for you. They'll service customers for you. They'll innovate for you but because they, they care. But re retail is a difficult market to do that in because typically, particularly here with a large expatriate population, mm -hmm. what the big retail Retailers do is that they hire staff by the plane load from overseas, yep. fly them in, give them a couple of weeks training, and and put them on the shop floor. That's the kind of the nature of an expatriate workforce. Sure. It makes that kind of inspirational leadership even harder, I would say. It certainly does make it harder, but the interesting thing is if you look at somewhere, someone like McDonald's where you have people who are in temporarily, the level of performance that somebody like McDonald's gets because they handle short-term staff, but it poses the question, why are you looking for short-term staff? Why are you not looking for more um, stability within your workforce? Uh, particularly if you're operating in an environment where, for example, you're a luxury brand because you need that emotional relationship with your clientele. You've used the word caring several times here mm -hmm. and it is obviously quite an important thing but you know the word caring comes in in different shapes and forms. I mean if we go back to UBS as an example I mean what made those ambitious well-qualified caring leaders they cared about the job and the company yep. but they were under pressure from shareholders to do the best they possibly could. Yep. So at what point does caring uh, go to extremes where you might turn a blind eye to trading excesses or uh, or worse even instrumental in it taking place in the first place uh, that boils down to values and, and there's a significant amount of research that, that shows it's also about what happens in the organization if somebody goes over the red line it's quite clear in the research that if somebody goes over the red line and nobody pulls them back and they benefit from it then somebody else will go over the red line and then somebody else and if everybody goes over the red line then as with LIBOR you just move the line and then nobody even notices. Let's talk about the world's greatest leadership race. It's taking place at the moment, the race to be the leader of mm -hmm. the United States. Two front runners appear to be Donald Trump and, and Hillary Clinton at the moment. That's not set in stone yet. How do you assess their performance as leaders and what would be your advice to either Donald or Hillary or perhaps even both if you were hired by their campaign teams? It goes back to my comment about if you want success you have to build a we not me culture and if you look at, at Donald uh, you could say that he's potentially building uh, not a we uh, culture at all because there is an element that suggests that it's actually dividing the nation. Equally you could suggest that Hillary because of her um, history in terms of her role and all the rest of it is not necessarily making people feel that it's about the me uh, or the we rather than the me so Hillary perhaps has to be more down to earth and to show people that she does genuinely care about everybody and Donald needs I think to show that he cares about people who don't necessarily agree with him rather than abusing them just in, in 30 seconds what characteristics do you think make the very best leaders if you were to sort of identify a few individual characteristics. It's, it's about, if you look at, for example, the, the motto of the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst is serve to lead. If you get a leader who gets the message across to their people that I'm here to get the best out of you because I believe in you and I'm going to support you, that's when you get the performance. It's about the people who are employed looking up at their leader being able to say, A, does this person know what they're doing? B, do I trust them? And if you can answer yes to both those questions, they'll perform for you. I guess one of the problems is in so many cases the answer is not yes when you ask that question. And that's the worry. Yeah. And that's why we need to change leadership for the good of individual sanity and the good of our economies. Just a quick question on how you change that, that behaviour and that culture. If you're in an organisation that has a large cadre of command and control leaders, this kind of, to use Malcolm's metaphor of little Hitlers, uh, and we've all worked in those organisations, yeah. how do you change that when it's, it's ingrained, it's in the bones, that, that 
sort of insidious leadership culture. It's not leadership culture, it's a control culture. The, the funny thing is that you're absolutely right. It's a culture within an organisation. If you get the individuals individually and talk to them, 90% of them don't like it. If they were given the opportunity to move into an environment where they could actually be more open, more honest, Every human being wants the same thing from their leaders. Every human being wants the same thing from work. And Aristotle made the quote 500 BC, you know, perfection, uh, pleasure in the work produces perfection in the job. Nothing's changed. Everybody wants that. So it's, an, it's the case of giving those people simple things they can do on a day-to-day -day basis that will inspire their people. Things that don't cost any money, you can do immediately, like asking for ideas, showing you care, helping people develop, understanding people make genuine mistakes, not jumping on them. That's what leadership is about. Is your, um, your presentation or your talk today, is it open to everybody? Yep. It's it open And where is it taking place? At the St Regis Hotel. St Regis Hotel. And that is at what time? The 24th at... Starting from 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock in the morning. People can uh, register to go along. Chris Roebuck, Pref Professor of Transformational Leadership at the Cass Business School from London. Thank you very much indeed for coming in for what was a fascinating chat. Thank you.